Hi everyone, I've got a treat for you today. Let's talk more about carbohydrates. Sweet. Hmm, yeah, enough of the puns. Let's see some chem. All right, we're in key concepts. You know, five part two, this is the last one. Well, not the last video. This covers, um, oh wait, no, there's a part three on proteins. So nearly at the end, getting pretty close. Okay, last part about carbohydrates. So in this video, we're gonna talk about bigger sugars, the complex carbohydrates. And we're gonna need to make them bigger by looking at acetals. So um, as we begin this section, let's bring in some more definitions, okay? Um, little bit of detail, more about carbohydrates. Right, you already know how to classify carbohydrates according to whether they contain an aldehyde or a ketone, right? Aldehydes, sugars with aldehydes are aldoses. Those sugars with a ketone are ketoses. Um, you can count the carbons, trioses. There are sugars with three carbons, hexoses, sugars with six. There you go. And we also know if given the Fischer structure of a sugar, we can identify it as a D sugar or an L sugar, right? The bottom most Chiarelli center has the alcohol, on the left in the fissure when it's an L sugar, which is pretty uncommon because most, most naturally occurring sugars are D sugars, exactly. Okay, add to that list of ways to classify sugars, one more, way, one more set of terms. Um, sugars can either be classified as reducing sugars or non-reducing sugars. And this is a, um, a reference to oxidation reduction chemistry. So I got a little paragraph here if you're interested in the background of it, but essentially sugars that have an aldehyde, a ketone or a hemiacetal, all you have to do is find at least one in their structure, then they are classified as reducing sugars. These functional groups, hemiacetal, ketone, aldehyde, they can act to reduce another reagent. Okay, so they're capable of reducing. The reducing agents, but they're also sugars. So they're called reducing sugars. Now there are some carbohydrates out there, other sugars, that do not contain an alde aldehyde ketone or hemiacetal. And you might be saying, wait, back in the last video, Dennis, you said a carbohydrate is defined to have either an aldehyde or a ketone. Yeah, but this is chemistry and it's full of exceptions. Not exactly lying here when I say there are some sugars that don't have aldehydes or ketones because they've been transformed into acetals. And so you can, an acetal can be reversed. It can be undone. Um, you can take an acetal, add um, acid or base. No, you can't add base. You can only hydrolyze it with acid and water. And then you can get back the aldehyde or ketone. So Non-reducing sugars are those sugars in which their aldehyde or ketone have reacted to form acetals. Okay, and then as we look at more complex carbohydrates, molecules contain or built from many um, smaller sugars. What you have to do is look at, at throughout the entire molecule, identify all the components, all the sugars that were used to make this one new sugar and make sure that nobody has an aldehyde ketone or hemiacetal. If you find at least one somewhere in this crazy structure, that will make it a reducing sugar. You only need to have one. And then the exception is if you search the entire structure of the sugar and everywhere where you expect to find aldehyde or ketone or hemiacetal and you don't, it's only an acetal. Everywhere acetals, only acetals, then they're non-reducing sugars. And what makes this a little complicated is that a sugar is defined to be an aldehyde or ketone and two or more alcohols. So throughout this whole process, you're ignoring the alcohol group. It's not helping you identify whether it's a reducing sugar or non-reducing sugar. We'll do some examples to clarify, but for now, um, just fixate on the idea that look at the structure of a sugar. If you find one aldehyde, one ketone, or one hemiacetal, boom, reducing sugar. If you can't find at least one of those three, it's a non-reducing sugar. Cool. All righty. So last time we talked about hemiacetals. 
and we talked about the mechanism, how to form acetal. So there's the slide again with the mechanism. Key features here are um, you start with an aldehyde, add two alcohols and an acid catalyst to make or create your acetal. So aldehyde or ketone, which every sugar has. And then you bring in an alcohol, bump up pi bond. And if you get halfway, you get to the hemiacetal. And this is all reversible. So the hemiacetal can be undone with acid and recover the aldehyde or ketone. But in the presence of another alcohol, here it is. Here's a second alcohol. Again, bump up the pi bond. You can make your way to the full acetal, but simply called the acetal. Okay. So last time we talked about hemiacetal. Now we're going and making the acetal. So um, same idea, same reaction. Take an aldehyde or a ketone and two alcohols to make your acetal. So here it is again, just a little drawn a little differently. Here's my aldehyde. Here are two alcohols. They're actually the same alcohol, just drawn differently, right? Two carbons here, two carbons there, same alcohol. So you react aldehyde or ketone, two alcohol groups with acid catalyst, you form the acetal linkage. And now what we're doing is saying, hey, sugars, <laughs> come on in. You guys have aldehydes and ketones. Yeah, they do. Here it is. Here is glucose, blood sugar, drawn in a Hayworth projection, Hayworth drawing. And you can see the aldehyde. And one of the um, glucose's alcohol groups is right here, poised, all set to close up the ring. And when one alcohol reacts, you can form a hemiacetal. Remember, it's, it's a carbon link to both an ether and an alcohol. And um, now I'm saying, hey, in this video, what if you bring in the second alcohol, you can go and make the full and complete acetal. So let's add a second alcohol molecule. And now you have two alcohols present, aldehyde, and now you can form the acetal in your sugar molecule. Done. Cool. So I know that's a really busy looking structure. Lots happening there. The color coding helps. You're not going to get the color coding on exams, but remember the hint from the last video? When you're given a Hayworth, go to the right hand side. Typically, that's where you'll find the hemiacetal. Or now, we'll add this. It's typically where you can also find the acetal, the carbon link to two ethers. Okay, and some terms come along with this, right? New idea. <laughs> Sugar's going to make acetals. Boom. All right, so what are you gonna call them? Well, how about sugars with acetals? Nah, that doesn't sound sciencey enough. Give us some pizzazz. They're called glycosides. Yeah, live with it, darn it. <laughs> Simply a sugar with an acetal. And what we're, what we're gonna do is grab this new oside suffix. Remember the os suffix identified sugars? Well, if you see an oside, it still has an os. O-S-E, no, add the I to the O-S, O-side, and that's a sugar, O-sending with an I, I don't know how that's identifying the acetal, but that's the system. If you've got the name of a sugar, oh, here's glucose, but we change the suffix to O-side, means you have glucose in the acetal form. Its aldehyde has been reacted to form the acetal. And it's also assumed that when you took glucose's aldehyde, one of the alcohols from glucose was used to make the acetal. That's what formed the ring. And then a second molecule supplied the second alcohol group to complete the acetal. Don't forget the other stuff we, we discussed in the first video, mainly that, hey, when you go from the open chain form, normally it'd be drawn vertically in the Fisher drawing, but you don't have to. Here's a Hayworth drawing of the open chain form. Um, you have, let's see how many chirality centers we have. Well, how many carbons have four different groups? Not this carbon, it's got a double bond. This only has three groups. The oxygen on two bonds, unwritten hydrogen and this carbon, those are the four bonds, three groups only. Um, here's a chirality center. This carbon is linked to a carbon, a carbon, and those two carbons are different. This one is a double bond O, single bond O. 
There's also an alcohol group and the unwritten hydrogen. Yeah, four different groups, chiral. And in the same way, you should identify that these are also chiral. This carbon is achiral, meaning not chiral, has two identical hydrogens. Four chiral isomers in the open chain form of this sugar molecule, glucose. But when it forms hemiacetal linkage, this hemiacetal now is chiral, whereas before that carbon was not. Okay, so we discussed this in the previous video. We said, hey, there's a new chirality center. There's two epimers of it, right? You can change the stereochemistry of this one. Sometimes the alcohol group is up, up is beta, and sometimes the alcohol, hey, where is it? It's not drawn here. Sometimes the alcohol group is pointing down, that's the alpha form somewhere else here. And then we had that analogy that if you had a boat, right, the boat with the Greek letter beta floating over the fishes, the alpha, that helped us remember that, oh yeah, beta means up. From the anomeric carbon, ooh, that's the other term, the anomeric carbon, that new carbon of the hemiacetal, the new chirality center is the anomeric carbon. Yeah, that bond outside the ring could either be up, which is the beta form, or that bond outside the ring could be down, it's the alpha form. I'm looking this over, see if I forgot anything. Oh, yeah, I did. Um, right here, what's this ethyl in front of the, this modified glucose name? Well, the ethyl's talking about the rest of the molecule, right? So let's break this down from the right side. O side means our sugar is in a hemiacetal, right here, carbon with two ethers. Gluco, that's short for glucose. That's telling us the stereochemistry of all these alcohol groups. It's saying it's a hexose, it's an aldose, aldohexose. Yeah, whatever makes glucose glucose, and it's a, oh wait, what makes glucose glucose, it's all contained here. That name, you'd had to memorize it to get this structure. The D form, that means the last chirality center, farthest from the aldehyde, is if it was a joint in a fissure, mm, then the alkyl group should be on the right side to give us a D form. So this is D glucoside. What's the beta? Well, the beta says when we close up the ring, the bond outside the ring is pointing up. It's the beta form. And now what's the ethyl? The ethyl is what's not glucose that completed the acetal linkage, right? This oxygen had to be an ether, not an alcohol, because that would be a hemiacetal, carbon linked to ether and alcohol. Is hemiacetal. When it's linked to two ethers, it's an acetal. Well, it needs this carbon. Where'd this come from? Or what is this set of carbons? It's a ethyl group. Phew, I think we covered it all. What else do we need to know? Ah, right, here we go. Here's alpha and beta. Oh my, I jumped the gun. Okay. <laughs> if you're more of a visual learner, not more auditory, Let's go over all this again and we'll look at words, help it sink in a little bit better. Okay, when you close up the ring, hemiacetal or an acetal, the bond outside the ring could be pointing down, that's the alpha form, or it could be pointing up, that's the beta form. Up is beta. Um, the only difference between these two molecules is that one chirality center, the stereochemistry, alpha or beta. One stereochemistry makes them, sorry, one Serogenic center difference makes some epimers, right? If you change, like if I were to draw this alcohol group down and this one down, I change two chirality centers. The first molecule, the original molecule compared to the molecule with two chirality centers changed would be a diastereomer. But if I start with one molecule and only change one chirality center, that's an epimer. And if you choose, to change the stereochemistry at the aldehyde or keep at the acetal or hemiacetal, that's a special epimer called an anomer. Yeah, and the carbon of the acetal or the hemiacetal is the anomeric carbon. And now a new term, which is this one right here. Um, this is a glycoside. Oside means it's an acetal of a sugar. So What's special about this compared to other sugars we've seen? Oh, it's an acetal. This bond is connecting to an ether. If it was connected to a hydrogen, that would be a hemiacetal. 
So this bond outside the ring is helping to make it a glycoside, oside ending. It's also the special glycosidic bond. It's the one that's either alpha or it's beta. It's the bond that points up or it points down. Out of all these bonds, that's the only one that determines alpha and beta. So give it a name, glycosidic bond. Um, it's quite likely on your next exam, which will be the final exam, right? Um, I might ask you to point, draw an arrow to a glycosidic bond and label it alpha or beta. Please make sure you draw your arrow to a bond. I've had students point at the oxygen. I don't know which, that's not a bond. <laughs> Sorry, it's like, are you pointing at this bond or that bond? If you point an arrow at the O, so please draw an arrow to the bond. Okay, what else we got? Well, that's plenty. Let's move on. Ooh, sample problems. Let's help solidify the ideas, these new ideas. Okay, so this is a typical final exam question now. Given the structure of arabinose, ooh, this molecule here, draw terbutyl alpha arabinoside. That's a mouthful. Okay, um, just as an aside, remember in this unit five section, I'm not asking you to memorize structures. So I have to give you a structure and then you modify it. How do you modify it? Well, this has an O's ending and then you have an O side ending. So you have to make it an acetal, a carbon linked to two ethers. Well, what are we given? What's well, the ring form? So this is a hemiacetal or an acetal. Sugar has an aldehyde or ketone. We should be looking for that double bond O or the Cho group if we're looking for an aldehyde or a ketone. But here it's all single bonds and in a ring, which means the aldehyde or ketone has reacted to form either the hemiacetal or the acetal. So this is the Hayward drawing. So let's start on the right-hand side. Oh, and here we found it, first try. Right here is a carbon link to both an ether and an alcohol, not two ethers. This is the hemiacetal. So that's kind of cool. We're halfway to the acetal. So let's take this structure and try and draw it. Make sure you keep your bonds in the same orientation because if I actually point this alcohol group up, it's no longer arabinose, right? Chirality of every carbon determines the name of the molecule. And then over here, well, now actually we have to do think about it. Um, which form of rabinose is given here? Um, it's in the hemiacetal form. There's two forms, right? Alpha and beta. So which form is this arabinose molecule? Well, find the anomeric carbon, the one that determines it all. This is the carbon of the hemiacetal acetal. And where's the bond not in the ring? Right here. It's not really the glycosidic bond because it's a hemiacetal, but you might as well call it a glycosidic bond. As soon as this hydrogen change of carbon, that will become the glycosidic bond. And that's above the ring. That's above the anomeric carbon. This is the beta bond. Beta, it's up. <laughs> I don't know why I put that at Greek mu, up. Up is beta. It's the boat floating above the fish. Which one did you want? Final exam question, you want the alpha form. So I have to point it down. And if I put the hydrogen here, now I have the alpha form, alpha arabinose. Yeah, but we're going after the O side. So delete that hydrogen. There we go. And to make this an acetal, we need some carbons here. Well, a methyl group, what? Um, a benzene ring, what? A terbutyl group. There you go. I don't know why it's so long, but there you go. I think I'm done. Here's the terbutyl, got it. Alpha, got it. This bonds the alpha form. Arabino, that's from this part. Got all my chirality centers right. All the alcohol groups right. And O side, yeah, this carbon is forming two ethers. It's the acetal. Done. Cool. Ooh, done with this whole row here. Column. Moving on to more complex things, complex carbohydrates. It's just an extension of what we just talked about. So 
let's go back to what we were just talking about, acetals. And he said, oh yeah, if you have an aldehyde or ketone, two alcohols, they can combine to form an acetal. And now what we're saying is, well, the second alcohol, sure it could be ethanol, a small, simple molecule, but nature says, mm, I like something better, more something with more purpose. How about a whole nother sugar? So instead of just using ethanol as a second alcohol, let's bring in another sugar. There's lots of alcohols. So pick one of the alcohols and nature, she gets to pick. She has some favorites. Um, but every time we pick a different one, that's going to create a different acetal, different molecule. Anyways, just see the main idea for now. Um, you're going to take an aldehyde ketone from one sugar, a second alcohol from the same sugar, and a second alcohol from a different sugar. You still have the aldehyde or ketone, two, two alcohols that make the acetal linkage. We just have some extra decorations. So the second alcohol brings in a second sugar, just copy and paste it over. And here's the acetal linkage, we're good. So specifically, here is a sugar in the hemiacetal form, it's reversible to get the open chain form. And then the aldehyde or ketone with two alcohols, oops, I forgot to color code that one. They link up to form the acetal. So same thing we did before. Looks a little more complicated, but when you analyze it, it really isn't. It's just forming an acetal. Details, um, new ideas. Hey, whenever nature brings in one sugar and connects it to, here, brings in one sugar and bring, connects it to a second sugar, you have two sugars. If you're naming a molecule with two chlorines, it would be a dichloral compound, right? If it had two amines, it'd be a diamino compound. Well, this one molecule has two sugars, so it's a disugar. No, call it a disaccharide. So this molecule is composed from two sugars. We're gonna label it a disaccharide. And guess what? Over here is another hemiacetal. So you can choose to bring in the same sugar or a different sugar, and up here, connect it and make another acetal. And if you did that, you would actually connect three sugars together to make one molecule. And what would you call that? A trisaccharide. You got it. Yeah. And then since we're doing di, tri, tetra, hexa, hepta, whatever saccharides, what happens if you just have a single saccharide? Well, that would be a monosaccharide. And now what we have to remember is that monosaccharides oftentimes are drawn in the ring form either a hemiacetal or an acetal. But they can also be drawn in open chain form or the Fischer projection. So if I ask you to classify all these structures in this row, are they disaccharides, trisaccharides, whatever saccharides? You'd say, well, this thing is a monosaccharide. It's one sugar. This thing is also a monosaccharide. It's glucose, blood sugar. And it's one of the simple carbohydrates. It's a monosaccharide. Ooh, are we ready for this stuff? Yes, we are. Okay, but let's start connecting two sugars together. So here's one that's found in beer and uh, malt balls. You guys like a malted shake? Um, that contains maltose. What is maltose? Well, it's got an O-S ending, so it's a sugar. Here's a structure. You can see two rings. It's a disaccharide. So it's a sugar composed from two sugars. And if you back up on the left-hand side, you'll see what's two sugars, uh, glucose and glucose. It's the same sugar twice. Um, why is this alpha glucose and that one beta glucose? Oh yeah, this ring form, a uh, Hayworth drawing, as the hemiacetal form, I looked on the right, and the bond outside the ring is pointing down, that's the alpha form. So this glucose molecule, the alcohol group of the hemiacetal is pointing down, that's the alpha form. The second glucose though, 
the alcohol group's pointing up, and there's the little beta. You're not going to see that on an exam. You'll, you'll have to pick it out. Here's the hemiacetal. The bond to an oxygen not in the ring is pointing up. That's the beta form. And then H says, hmm, I'm going to take this hemiacetal here, and I'll take the alcohol from carbon-4 of the other glucose molecule, and let's link them up. Specifically, we're going to take away an OH and an H, remove a water molecule, and in that way create a acetal. So this is now a glycoside, a sugar glyco is sugar. Uh, oside has an acetal leakage, but it's composed of two sugars, so it's also a disaccharide. And what is this bond? Well, that's what's making it a acetal. It's the glycosidic bond. And relative to this ring, where the anomeric carbon is, that's the key. Here's the anomeric carbon. This bond not in the ring is pointing down. That's the alpha form. OK. And when you connect glucose to glucose, that makes maltose. Um, wait, what's this beta mean there? I thought it was an alpha form. Well, maltose is when you connect glucose to glucose in the alpha, with an alpha glycosidic bond. But in maltose, we got this other sugar on the right here that's still in the hemiacetal form. And for this alcohol group, it's up as beta. So that tells us this is the beta form of maltose. If the hemiacetal had the alcohol group pointing down, then that would be the alpha form of maltose. Maltose is defined to be two glucoses connected by an alpha glycosidic bond. More specifically, it's an alpha glycosidic bond connecting carbon one. So go back over here. Um, there's a one here on the first sugar. So if we had to name this, IUPAC name, start the most important functional group. This is where the aldehyde used to be. Start there, carbon one, count around ring for this hexose. Here's four. Do the same thing on the other glucose. There's carbon one, count up to four. And now the glycosidic bond is connecting carbon one to carbon four. It's connecting carbon one to carbon four. There's the arrow from one to four. One is where the anomeric carbon is. The acetal carbon is on one. It's connecting two carbon four to the other sugar. And maltose, sorry. Beta threw me off. It's like, that's an alpha glycosidic bond. Yeah, right over here. Maltose has an alpha one to four glycosidic bond. Okay, so I need you to be familiar with this notation. I need you to be able to construct it, right? So if you see a structure, the structure might be this one, and you'll say, okay, um, identify the notation for the glycosidic bond. You'd say, yeah, hey, where's the acetal? Oh, that's right. Acetal is a glycosidic bond. The glycosidic bond is pointing down. That's the alpha form. So that gives me the alpha. And then where are the numbers? OK, on the exam, I will number the monosaccharides for you. So then you can just compare and contrast. OK, here's this carbon. Here's this carbon. Oh, yeah, this carbon one. This carbon of the ether oxygen is connected to here. Oh, that was this one. Oh, that was number four. So start on the anomeric carbon on carbon one, you go to the other carbon four, and you have one to four like that, and it's an alpha glycosidic bond. Cool. All right, let's get a little practice with that. Sample problem. Given the structure of glucose, here's two of them, <laughs> pick one. Draw a disaccharide of glucose with a beta one to four glycosidic bond. OK, so I want it beta. So I'm going to start with this drawing that's already got that bond up as beta. So let's just copy this structure. Here's my Hayworth, kind of a hexagon lying outside, all vertical bonds. Here's my up as beta. And if you put the H here, that'll be the hemiacetal form. But we're going to make it a disaccharide, so this needs to be an acetal. Get all the other details, so it's still glucose. So this is a CH2OH, H, H, O, H, H, O, H, H, O, H, H. Good. All right, I got a monosaccharide. I need two of them. 
And this oxygen comes from the second alcohol. I got the beta part. Yep, this one's beta right here. The anomeric carbon pointing up to the oxygen. It's on carbon one. Yep, it's on carbon one. We want number four. I want disaccharide of both glucoses. So what you have to do is just bring in another sugar. And you can choose either the alpha or the beta form. Can we? Yeah, it doesn't say which disaccharide we want, either the alpha form of the disaccharide or the beta. So you get to pick. All right, um, I'll pick this one then. Just make them both beta, just because we feel like it. There we go. So here comes my second sugar. And yikes, all right, poor planning on my part. Squeezing us all in here, drawing in all my stuff. So right here, carbon four, there's H. In the original structure, it's OH, but I had to take away the H, so this oxygen only makes two bonds. It's an ether. Then down here, this carbon has an alcohol up. Next carbon's alcohol is down. That's what makes it glucose. And now here's your choice. Here's the hemiacetal. And I, like I said, it's arbitrary. I'm gonna just pick the alcohol group pointing up. Make sure that bond isn't left dangling. There's a hydrogen there. If you left it alone, it would be a methyl group. There we go. There's a disaccharide glucose. And is it beta one to four? Yep, from the hemiacetal. No, this is acetal. From the anomeric carbon, it's up as beta, beginning on carbon one of the first sugar, going to carbon four of the second. Nice. Uh, bonus question, given the structure of beta maltose, draw alpha. So all you had to do is scribble out the OH, make that an H, and put the OH down here. Yep, and that's the alpha form of maltose. Nice. What else we got? Two more disaccharides. Two more that you've probably heard about. Um, here's sucrose. Why is it sucrose? It connects glucose to fructose. We saw fructose's open chain structure, the Fisher drawing, in the first video. Um, I think we may have seen galactose. If you take galactose and connect to the glucose, through a beta glycosig bond, that makes lactose. Um, why is this beta lactose? Because this hemiacetal could be up or down. So what's alpha lactose? That's where this is a hydrogen and this was alcohol. This would be the alpha form of lactose. What makes it lactose is you're connecting galactose to glucose through a beta glycosig bond. And why are some people lactose intolerant? Because people that are lactose intolerant are unable to hydrolyze, undo the acetal of lactose. It's in the beta form. And that's different from the alpha form. So sucrose is table sugar. It's in the alpha form. Our bodies, most humans, are able to hydrolyze this linkage. So if you're digesting this, you ate something sweet made with sugar, you know, sucrose rather, um, your body would then, trying to get all the energy out of these molecules, first hydrolyze this into two sugars, and then break each one of these down in metabolism and cellular respiration. You get all the carbo, you know, get all the energy out, the calories out of it. Um, but someone who's lactose intolerant, the first step of digestion of disaccharides is breaking the glycosidic bonds, splitting into two sugars. And uh, people with lactose intolerant, they lose the ability, the special enzyme, nature's catalysts or enzymes, um, lose the ability to cut the beta glycosidic bond. Enzymes are so specific, it can only do one or the other most of the time. So there you go. Um, what else? Um, here, if I gave you the structure and asked you to label the glycosidic bond with this notation, well, you'd have to get some numbers. <laughs> I have to tell you, this is carbon one, two, three, four, five, six of galactose. And then of glucose, this is one, two, three, four, five, six. And then you'd say, okay, the, uh, the anomeric carbon, the one that's in the eth double ether, the acetal, outside the ring, it's up, up is beta. So that's the beta form. 
and it begins on carbon one and it goes to carbon four. Cool. And then for sucrose, I'd have to number, well, actually there's a four here, there's a one here. And then it turns out that in fructose, the numbering starts here, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'd have to give you those numbers. And I'd say, okay, label this. You'd say, okay, here's my anomeric carbon. I see the double ether bond outside the ring is down. That's the alpha form. And it's connecting carbon one to carbon two. Nice. And if I asked you to do sucrose, specifically sucrose, I would give you full credit. But let's just pay that. Well, look at this molecule a little harder, a little more analytically. If you focus on the left ring, where's the anomeric carbon? It's right here. This carbon's linked to two ethers. Cool. It's an acetal. Cool. Now let's focus on the second sugar. Where's the anomeric carbon here? Well, it's supposed to be on the right. I'm supposed to find a carbon linked to two oxygens. A hemiacetal would have this carbon connected to an ether and an alcohol. This carbon specifically, though, is connected to an ether, a hydrogen, a carbon, and another carbon. Wait, that's not the anomeric carbon. That's not a hemiacetal, nor is it an acetal. Um, this carbon has two H's and only one O. This one has two H's and one O. This, no, no, wait, what's this one? Oh, right here. This carbon's the anomeric carbon. What's it doing on the left-hand side? Well, nature's decided to take the two anomeric carbons of each sugar and link them together to make it a disaccharide. So in order to draw it correctly, we have to flip this around, right? Because normally we put the anomeric carbon on the right-hand side, but you can't do that in this disaccharide. You gotta get both anomeric carbons close enough to link them together. So when you focus on this ring, here's the anomeric carbon. Where's, is this the alpha form or the beta form? Well, the bond to the oxygen is down, but it's on the wrong side. So it's out of bounds. Turns out this is the beta form. And it's because the molecule was not drawn correctly, right? We've been talking about drawing it correctly with the anomeric carbon on the right side of the ring. And only when it's on the right side, then you can trust, hey, the bond is up, up is beta. Okay, so this would have been out of balance for the exam. The anomeric carbon is not appearing on the right side, so I don't expect you to be able to identify whether it's alpha or down, alpha or beta. But it explains why it's a beta form, because relative to this ring, this bond happens to be pointing up, it's the beta form. And this ring, this other bond is the alpha form. There are two glycosidic bonds, one for each ring. If I lost you, let's try You can rewind the video, uh, but let's try this one. Let's focus on this ring. Where's the anomeric carbon of this monosaccharide? Well, it's erased over here. <laughs> oh, wait, as I put it over down here, here's an alcohol, here's an ether, here's the anomeric carbon for this ring. Anomeric carbon, ooh, it's on the right hand side. The alcohol group's pointing down, that's the alpha form, right? Here's the alcohol group. Anomeric carbon for this ring, go over here. Oh yeah, there's a pair of ethers, here's anomeric carbon. And the bond, you know, anomeric carbon's on the right, bond's pointing up, up is beta. We're good. Yeah, okay. What else do we need to know? Oh, Kind of review problem. Remember we started this video with the definition of reducing sugars? What was that again? A reducing sugar is something that has either one, an aldehyde, or two, a ketone, or three, a hemiacetal. Wow, and I scribbled all over these. <laughs> oh my. Um, are they sucrose and lactose? Are they reducing sugars? Let's start with lactose. Can you find an aldehyde? I'm looking for CHO. That's usual um, abbreviation for an aldehyde group. Well, or I can look for a double bond O. I see no double bonds. I don't see CHO. That's not CHO. I'm looking for CHO. Can't find CHO. Um, doesn't have an aldehyde. Does it have a ketone? Now I'm looking for double bond O. I don't see one. Nope. Does it have a hemiacetal? All right, here's the acetal. So no. Oh, wait. So if you look at my scribblings, I put the acetal 
hemiacetal putting them down. So yes, it has a hemiacetal. Lactose is then a reducing sugar. I found one, all you have to do is find one. Find an aldehyde, a ketone, or a hemiacetal, and boom, reducing sugar. Now try it for sucrose. Well, there's no CHO, there's no double bonds, there are no aldehydes or no ketones. Any hemiacetals? Well, here's an acetal, carbon with two ethers. Here's another acetal, carbon with two ethers. This molecule only has acetals. No aldehyde, no ketone, no hemiacetal. That makes it a non-reducing sugar. There you go. So there's a, a good practical example of reducing and non-reducing sugars. All right, let's end this with more than two or three or four or five. Um, we got monosaccharides has one sugar, one simple sugar. And then we had disaccharides, tri, you could have tetrasaccharides. I'll have four, it's made from four simple sugars. It could be four glucose molecules. It could be a galactose, a, um, a rabinose, a ribose, and another glucose, all connected, four simple sugars, and that would make a tetrasaccharide. You know what disaccharide is? We got sucrose and lactose and maltose as examples. Um, but if you go higher than, I think it's 12. I think what, once you get up to, what is it, seven or eight, up to 12, they're called oligosaccharides. They have a few saccharides, the oligo, I think means few. Poly means many. So after you get past 12, hundreds, <laughs> thousands, yes, possible, quite common actually, then you make polysaccharides, very complex carbohydrates, and some you're familiar with. So here's some examples of polysaccharides. You've heard of starches. Well, there's two um, that we, you should be most familiar with. Um, you should be familiar with amylose. That's where it's unbranched. And amylopectin, that's where the, the molecule has some branches. I'll show you, show you structures in just a second. In starch, all the glycosate bonds, right? It's a polysaccharide, sugar connected to sugar, connected to sugar, connected to sugar. Okay, actually, that's a good analogy for branch and then branch. If you find one end of a starch and you look at, hey, here's sugar connected to sugar, connected to sugar, connected to sugar, 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 and you make it all the way down the chain, that's a straight chain, unbranched chain, and that's amylose. All of those sugars are going to be connected through an alpha pointing down bond, starting on carbon one of the anomeric carbon, going to carbon four of the next sugar. They're all alpha one to four linkages. That defines um, starch. It's made from glucose. That's the other definition. Amylopectin. So we start with the glucose, connect the glucose, connect the glucose, connect the glucose. You got a chain going this way. And then off of one of those rings, you start a new chain, a branch. And then that branch, glucose, glucose, glucose. Then you can branch off of that again and branch off of that again. That's amylopectin. I'll have you, I'll show you some, some structures and make them more clear in a second. Those are energy storage for plants. So when a plant does a photosynthesis, right? Takes in carbon dioxide through the leaves and draws up water from the roots. A little sunlight mixes water and carbon dioxide to form glucose. Waste product for a plant is oxygen, not so wasteful for us. The plant makes lots and lots of glucose waiting for a rainy day or at nighttime when there's no sunlight, can't make more glucose, it needs to store it. Well, instead of just having all this glucose floating around in the plant cells, let's condense it, pack it together. Let's connect a glucose, a glucose, a glucose. Let's make starches. So the plant starts storing excess glucose, either as amylose or amylopectin. People, yeah, we run off of glucose too, blood sugar. So we eat the plants, plants become part of us, the old circle of life thing. Um, we eat too much. Well, you need to eat a little extra, save it for a rainy day or when you're not, you know, can't catch a fast food joint or something. No, we shouldn't be doing that. Anyways, <laughs> our bodies are naturally gonna store some extra glucose for times of need. 
and it's very efficient to pack glucose or glucose to glucose and actually make branches. It makes a very condensed structure that's similar to amylopectin, but if you look at the full structure, it's not. It's different from amylopectin, but still branched, and we call it glycogen. It's very, very similar. All the glucose molecules are connected by alpha-1 to 4 linkages. It just has more branches. It's also found in animals and people, it's glycogen. Why is that? Why are there more branches? I better remember as we end this video, I'll show the structures and we'll go back to that question. Cellulose, still taking glucose, connecting glucose to glucose to glucose, unbranched, straight chain, but now we're gonna do it through a beta glycosic bond. And you remember people who are lactose intolerant, they can't cut that beta glycosic bond between a disaccharide? Some people can. If you're not lactose intolerant, you can still break the, gly the beta glycosic bond of lactose. But that enzyme, nature's catalyst, can't break the beta glycosic bond of cellulose. So you can eat cellulose. It's called fiber in our diet. Um, wood actually contains about 50% cellulose, these straight chains of glucose, 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 but connected through a beta glycosic bond. Cool. Now, microorganisms, or microorganisms can digest, break down wood and pulp, and well, you know, cows have the bacteria in their stomach to help break it down. That's why the, you know, all those animals that graze, they're breaking down the cellulose and getting sugar out, the glucose out of it. Yeah hydrolyzing those acetals. But people, animals, we can't do it. We don't have the catalyst that can cut that beta glycosic bond. And then there's chitin, chitin, maybe it's chitin. Um, it looks very, very similar to cellulose, but one of the alcohol groups has been swapped out with an, with an amide. And it makes for a very strong structure used in the exoskeleton of crustaceans. Kind of cool. All right, so let's take some a look at some of these structures and make sure we understand why people and animals prefer glycogen to have more highly branched structures. Let's go to another slide. So in key concepts, that's actually where we wanna go, not these silly slides that allow me to draw. Um, let's go to key concepts directly, continue that document. Here's some definitions, so here's some structures. So yeah, we got blood sugar in the open chain form because I can see the aldehyde. It's not a ring. It's in the shape of a ring, but not a ring yet. Um, in the bloodstream, it's been analyzed that blood sugar is less than half a percent in the open chain form. 36% is in the alpha form that's in a ring. 63%, ooh, high number, is in the beta form. Why is that? Why is it not 50-50 alpha and beta? Because the beta form up as beta is also an equatorial bond, and there's more room here. The alpha form, it's more crowded. These, um, the hydrogens on carbons one and three are pointing down, or actually this is one, here's three and five. They're actually crowding out one, three diaxial interactions. We learned about that in chair confirmations. Makes the alpha form less stable. Nature prefers the more stable substrate, more stable molecule rather. But if you take the alpha form, Link them alpha one to four, alpha one to four, alpha one to four, sugar after sugar after sugar, that's amylose. You start branching, it's amylopectin, that's starch. But take the beta form, up is beta, an equatorial bond, link them uh, um, beta one to four, beta one to four, beta one to four. So I'm finding the acetal, here's the acetal, here's the acetal, two ethers, acetal, two ethers, and that's up, that's up. That's up, these are all the beta forms, beta one to four, that's cellulose. It's built from the same molecule glucose, but it's an axial versus an equatorial bond that makes a world of difference. You and I can digest these. The beta form, sorry, this is the alpha form. Alpha, <laughs> one to four linkages are hydrolyzed in our body. We can digest these. The beta form, we can't. This makes up wood, paper, and cotton. Oh, this might be a cotton shirt. Ng -ng -ng. There's Blood sugar in here, there's glucose. And don't eat this, Dennis. You can't digest it because it's formed from glucose bound up in beta glycosate bonds. I don't have the enzyme to cut it. But the straight chain allows these chains to stack and make some threads 
very fibrous material, very strong material. Have you ever built anything out of starch? Well, maybe a mashed potato volcano, you can pour the gravy in it and you can build that. But starches are lousy building materials because of this alpha glycosate bond. This downward bond actually puts a kink in the molecule, whereas the beta makes it nice and straight. You can see the kink here in amylose. Amylose actually forms a helix. And one of these molecules has a hard time sticking to another amylose molecule, sticking to another one because they're helical structure. It's a big gap in the middle where water fills in. And yeah, it's a lousy building material. You need the straight chain form. One of these cellulose stacking on another cellulose, stacking on another one, another, another, make a fibrous material, a wood product, cotton, paper. Um, yeah, something that's durable. Here's amylopectin, right? So as you look down this diagonal line, you actually can catch the alpha, 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 alpha one to four. So the chain itself is straight chain, but then off of this sugar, there's a branch coming off of six. So the glycosate bonds here on alpha, it's a one to six glycosate bond. And then that begins another chain of alpha one to four, alpha one to four, alpha one to four. And maybe somewhere else, there's another branch. Yeah, so somewhere else. And then glycogen, um, it actually has the same structure. It's not labeled nicely, but this is carbon one to six again. And it's um, an alpha. And this is alpha. <laughs> it's glycogen, very, very similar structure in the amylopectin. It's just that when you compare them, amylose, amylopectin rather, sorry, getting a little weird. Amylopectin compared to glycogen, zoomed in, they're identical. But if you start zooming out, Glycogen has many, many more branches, branches on branches. So if you zoom out completely so you can see the whole molecule, it might look like this. And this is a two-dimensional representation. Each little dot is one glucose monosaccharide linked together to form long chains, branches on branches. That's amylopectin. But you also have to think three-dimensionally. So it's not a flat ring with all these dots, chains coming off. Think of it three-dimensionally like a koosh ball. <laughs> and this is a bad representation because each one of these is a single chain. And so within one of these fibers here, you get branches on branches on branches. But at least you're starting to get closer to what a glycogen molecule physically looks like. It's huge, but it's also very dense, right? Each dot represents a glucose molecule. So in our liver, I think that's where glycogen is stored. Ex excess glucose is packed into, built up into these glycogen molecules. And then um, big koosh ball in these liver cells. We're restoring all this extra glucose in times of need. So here's the question, why? Why do plants pack their extra glucose in amylopectin? Why do people and animals pack their extra glucose in glycogen? What use would all these extra branches have? Well, think about what's what's one of the big differences between plants and animals and people? Mobility, the ability to move. Plants don't move very quickly. People and animals do. <laughs> we have a greater need for glucose. You might be resting and the predator comes creeping up and surprise the heck out of you. You got to run, fight or flight. You need glucose now. Um, you need a whole bunch of it. So you send a whole bunch of enzymes to the liver and said, hey, start breaking off all the glucose molecules. So you hit it hard with a whole bunch of enzymes, they attack the surface, and everywhere on the surface, there's an end of a chain. So you can snip off one of those glucose molecules very quickly, and then there's another end of a chain. You can snip that off, you can just start shaving the three-dimensional ball, releasing tons of glucose really, really quickly into the bloodstream to supply the body's need for glucose. Plant, however, sends its enzymes to this end of the molecule, start shaving off one by one, you get some glucose coming off. Not like if you hit this, the whole surface have ends of the molecules, ends of this, yeah, ends of the molecules, where you can shave off, cut off a glucose molecule. So it's all about supplying the need. Cool, structure has function. Here's chitin, ending there. So um, go back to cellulose, straight chains, beta, so here we go. Um, we got the, the um, 
Anomatic carbon here, two ethers, up is beta. Anomatic carbon is right here. Wait, the oxygen was supposed to be drawn up here. So this is not drawn collect correctly. Looks like this is pointing down. Well, this is free to spin. So when drawn correctly, then when the oxygen of the ring is up here and the anomatic carbon is down here, then we can trust this upward bond to be beta. But we move the ether in the ring down here. This is still beta. Sorry, not on the exam. This is still beta. These are all beta glycosidic bonds from one to four. However, one of the alcohols on carbon two has been swapped out with amide. C double bond O with an N. And we'll see in the next video that amides are the linkages between amino acids that make up proteins. And proteins are very strong, stable molecules. Why? Oh, way back in unit three, I think it was, when we talked about acid chlorides, anhydrides, esters, and amides. Amides are the most stable, most resistant to chemical attack. Hey, that'd be a good thing to build some building materials out of. So chitin builds up, makes up the exoskeleton of crustaceans, very durable material mainly because of these amide groups and that beta glycosidic bond was difficult to break. That's enough for now. I'll see you in the next video.